Hi there. This is Jack Sixt as producer of Heart of the Matter. Before we get started, we just want to let you know that this episode is about the story of parents who lost their child to an opioid overdose. This topic is incredibly important and can be difficult to listen to, so we ask that you use listener discretion before you get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Heart of the Matter. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas, and today we're going to talk to two people um, I met early on uh, several years ago in my sort of work in the recovery field, and this couple really, really inspired me. James Winnefeld and his wife, Mary Winnefeld, Sandy and Mary as they're called, lost their son uh, to a heroin overdose. And it happened on literally the first week of his freshman year of college after they dropped him off, healthy, fine, thinking that, you know, he was going to be just great and starting the most amazing experience of his life. They experienced the kind of tragedy and heartbreak that many find um, incomprehensible. And I don't know, as a parent myself, I'm not sure how I could survive something like this. Sandy and Mary have taken their heartbreak and turned it into action. Sandy used to be vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. He was the number two ranking military office in the country. Together, they co-founded Safe Project, which is a nonprofit committed to overcoming the epidemic of addiction in the United States. And they have really spoken out to other parents in an effort to save other kids' lives. We know that nearly half of all teenagers who suffer from addiction of some sort also suffer from either anxiety or depression. And the key to saving these kids is to getting them treatment early on. And that's what Sandy and Mary have dedicated themselves to. They are an amazing family. And I hope you're going to enjoy hearing from them and are as moved by them and their story as I was. Admiral Mary, thank you so much for being with us today. Hello, Elizabeth. It's really nice to be with you. Thank yeah. you. It's been, gosh, it's been three years since you got, Admiral, what you call the worst, most shocking call of your life. I can't imagine that it's any easier three years after losing your son to opioids. No, it's it's never any easier. You just learn how to deal with it a little bit, a little bit better as every day goes by. So um, if that's understandable, I think. Mm. So it, it, we still wake up in the morning uh, wanting to save a life. Um, and that hasn't died one bit. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, time doesn't heal the pain. What time gives you, it, it teaches you how to live with the pain. But the pain is still there. It still is raw. Um, someone is missing from our family. An important part of your family is no longer with you. Uh, your son had gone to his freshman year in college, and you had dropped him off full of great hope. Um, he had battled an addiction to opioids um, and had gotten treatment, and you thought he was doing okay. Yeah, he um, had gone through 15 months of residential treatment. Um, he was out. He was ready to, to jump into school. He had signed up for the EMT club at his college. He was applying to be an EMT for major sporting events in the city of Denver. He was taking a night class on EKG training, and he really wanted to jump back into life again. But what we didn't understand at that, at that point in time was just how powerful uh, the opioid connection is with the brain, and that he was still very vulnerable and needed that support and that structure, and unfortunately, that was not there for him. Tell me about Jonathan as a child. Um, nearly half of all teenagers who suffer from addiction of some sort have underlying mental health challenges. I actually personally, um, as one of those kids, I mean, I had lifelong anxiety and that led me to alcohol addiction in my in adulthood. But I think that number's higher. I think many, many more people suffer from anxiety or depression or something. Yeah, you know, John was, a, was the younger brother in a military family, adored his older brother. Uh, we moved around an awful lot. It was difficult for John, much more difficult than it was for his brother. And I think over the course of time, he developed uh, anxiety and depression. 
that eventually turned into substance dependence. Yeah, and he, uh, over the years, teachers always said he has attention deficit. We had him tested for that. Mm -hmm. um, and he it never showed any signs of having attention deficit. Um, what we didn't realize all along is that he was suffering um, from anxiety, from acute anxiety, which can often be uh, misunderstood, misdiagnosed as a form of ADD. And we, uh, for many years, you know, refused to put him on any medications, et cetera. Finally, when he hit high school and he was really having a rough time, uh, we did put him on Adderall, which for anyone who has anxiety, that's the worst medication in the world that you can be put on. It just amps you up. Yes. And that's when things really started to tumble out of control. Um, he with, basically needed uh, alcohol initially to come down from the Adderall at night because it mm. really amped him up. He was already anxious. And then that migrated into other substances. Did he talk to you about his anxiety? Was he able to verbalize that? He would talk to me about it. He would say, mom, I just, I don't feel right. I don't feel like everyone else at school. I don't feel like I'm getting the same joy out of life. I don't feel, you know, he would uh, spend a lot of time in his room. He was a prodigious reader, uh, loved to write. Um, and so, you know, at first I thought that it's depression. Uh, mm. But then now that I've learned more about anxiety and, you know, acute anxiety leads into depression and it was just the perfect storm. Do you know at what point he did start turning to substances to alleviate that anxiety? I would, uh, it was probably his sophomore year, his, the summer between sophomore and junior year. And we really, I did not, he was not the type of young man that was going out to parties mm -hmm. and, and doing, you know, the binge drinking type of thing. Um, it, during his junior year in high school, I, I, he was um, a highly functioning addict. Um, and that he would go to school in the morning. Uh, apparently he was doing marijuana before school, which would just mellow him out. He'd go through school. He was on the varsity baseball team. Um, he was a pitcher. And so by the time he came home at night, we had no idea, you know, mm. and he was getting through in his grades. You know, he got early acceptance into college. His grades, you know, they weren't all A's, but they were acceptable. Um, you know, I even found out that he took his SATs high. But for him, it was just a way of feeling normal and being able to relax uh, and to fit in. So, uh, you know, eventually that does catch up to you. And he really spiraled between his junior and senior year. Um, and then his senior year in high school is when we ended up having to pull him out early. Thankfully, he had completed all of his requirements for graduation and the school graduated him early. Um, but then he went into treatment. So he was not able to graduate with the rest of his friends. What was the escalation on substances that he was using to help relieve the anxiety? You said he started with alcohol, marijuana? He started, he started with alcohol and then he shifted to marijuana. We later found out that he had shifted to Xanax. Hmm. Uh, what we didn't know. Where was he getting that? In, in the high school bathroom. Wow. No problem. Piece of cake. Um, and then what we didn't realize is that he had experimented with opioids. Um, and uh, any, of, any of the several times that he had a really bad incident and we, we actually took him into the hospital and he was tested, they never once found any opioid uh, related drugs in his system. It was always marijuana and alcohol. So when we put him into treatment, we thought we were having him treated for substance dependence on alcohol mostly and marijuana, marijuana and possibly Xanax. And so we, we not only didn't know about the, the tremendous um, vulnerability of somebody coming out of treatment who has been on opioids, um, you know, we just, we just had no idea that he had even been doing opioids. So there's sort of a double vulnerability there. If we, it's, it goes back to if we only knew then what we know now, we would have been able to save our son. How did you not know that he was doing opioids? He didn't figure that out while he was in treatment? Well, you know, um, the old uh, HIPAA rules, um, mm. He turned 18 right as he entered treatment. And so we were only allowed to know what he was willing to tell us. And he didn't tell us about the opioids. He hinted that he had been doing some you know, bad stuff. But there's also a tendency as a parent uh, to want to believe the best in your, in your son or daughter. And, and I just don't think we processed that, frankly. Uh, 
And uh, even to the point that the weekend before we dropped him off at college, we took him out uh, to Colorado and did a very short vacation. And we, we noticed that he was very edgy. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was sweating a lot. Um, uh, you know, there seemed to be a lot of anxiety. And we thought he was just worried about going to college. And in, to the point that the day we dropped him off at college, you wouldn't believe how good looking this kid. I mean, he, he was sharp as a tack, you know, dressed to the nines, you know, very actually confident and relaxed. So fooled us even more. At that time, he was in withdrawal because, as Mary mentioned, he had taken this EKG course in Denver to prepare himself for college. Well, walking home from that course at night uh, to where he was staying is where he passed by Denver's open air heroin market, which is where he relapsed. And he didn't, we didn't know it. Um, but in fact, he was in withdrawal uh, the last couple of days we were with him. And then it was just three days later, like three days he yeah. was on that campus? Yeah, three days. Who called you? I was called by a campus administrator. I was up at Harvard giving a talk and I, I, my phone rang and I, I, I had, didn't recognize the number, but I stepped outside and that's where I got the, the awful news. So obviously I dropped everything I was doing and, and came back home and we flew out to Denver that night. But uh, it's just unbelievable and we we always knew there was a possibility that lj or that, that i'm sorry jonathan John. would relapse into marijuana or alcohol mm -hmm. but that didn't seem to us like a fatal risk mm -hmm. and if we had known about opioids and if we had known about how the brain uh reacts uh when it is in recovery uh from opioids we would have done a lot of things differently we'll get to that in a second mary did is was it was Sandy your your husband Admiral Winnefeld was he the one who told you or did you get a call as well no he uh was the one who called and told me um and just took my breath away um as it would you know any parent um especially you know a mom you always want to try to fix things so when you finally feel like you can take a breath and maybe this is a new start um and then to get hit with this was um just absolutely devastating um and devastating to know that you know he was back in his dorm room and that his roommate thought he was just snoring and didn't realize at the time that um his system his body you know his lungs were shutting down um so just all the way around a pretty horrible story yeah yeah oh, my heart breaks for both of you truly <clears throat> i have a 17 year old son who's about to go off to school and I can't even fathom getting a call like that. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, that's, um, and I know we'll talk about more, but I think that is one of the reasons why we are so adamant about sharing our story is because if his roommate would have known this was happening, Jonathan had Narcan in his room. Um, but his roommate didn't know what he was going through. His roommate didn't know about Narcan. His, you know, John did. Yeah. So yeah. kept all of this inside. So you found out shortly thereafter that he had gotten heroin and that it was laced with fentanyl mm -hmm. a That's drug right. we're seeing now you know appearing in yeah. everything yeah from heroin to marijuana i mean it's yeah. everywhere it's everywhere it's per pervasive he was one of seventy-two thousand people that year who died from some sort of an overdose i think it was around forty-two thousand that died from opioid overdoses uh and you know there's nothing like like having somebody you love deeply as one of those statistics I'd like to go back to when you were trying to get help for Jonathan in high school, when you sent him away for treatment. And Admiral, you are one of the most powerful men in the military. Um, and yet it was difficult to find a place that could treat Jonathan. And the military didn't cover the cost of that. No, they didn't. Uh, they didn't at the time, and I'm not sure they still do today, really understand the complexities uh, of, uh, of substance dependence. Uh, and complicating that was the fact that John was within a couple of weeks of his 18th birthday when that happened. So it made it only even harder to find a place that would take him. And so we were, we were presented with a very short list by the military's healthcare system of, of places we could send him, almost none of which were suitable for him. And, and after Mary, uh, a week of desperately searching on the internet and every, any other way she could, trying to find a place, we were very lucky that a friend of a friend turned us on to a very good treatment facility in uh, Pennsylvania, and that's where Jonathan ended up after a week uh, in the 
psych ward in Richmond, Virginia, because there were not enough beds in Northern Virginia for him to go into uh, some sort of temporary holding where he could uh, detox. That must have been an incredibly helpless feeling. I mean, to go to go from being in a position of power where you can make things happen literally all over the world involving hundreds of thousands of military personnel to just focused on your one son trying to get him help and in and in that short period of time because as we all know it's important to get them right away into treatment once they're safely detoxed from whatever substance they're on well and for us i think and again coming back you know to the mom thing you want to be able to fix everything and and you know how could this happen um, so uh, yeah, insurance did not cover it. They didn't cover any of the counseling sessions we had beforehand. Um, TRICARE, nothing. They gave us referrals to places as my, as Sandy said, that, um, would not accept our son, um, because he was about to turn 18 or it was for, you know, other types of illnesses. So we really were stuck at the time. The other thing that they didn't really understand, and not many still do, is, is the um, inextricable link between mental health and substance dependence. Mm -hmm. you know, there are people who become substance dependent who do not have you know, strictly a mental health issue. Um, but, but that is more often than not uh, the case that there is some linkage there. And you know, so comorbidity or, or whatever, where you have a treatment facility that not only handles the substance dependence, but also handles the mental health issue, is, was, at least at the time, very difficult for us to find. And I think it still is yeah. that. And for Jonathan, you know, his, the, the pivotal point for us and how we got there is one night um, he had, had alcohol, too much to drink, and he wanted to take his life. Um, and thankfully, and I say, thankfully, he ended up in a car accident hitting the telephone pole. Nobody was injured. He was only slightly injured, but that was when we knew that we could no longer keep him safe at home. I could no longer heal him, protect him, and we needed to get him someplace and, you know, someplace quickly. Hi there, Heart of the Matter listeners. My name is Rachel Vitali, and I am one of the helpline specialists at Partnership to End Addiction. If your child is struggling with substance use or addiction and you don't know what to do, there is help. Partnership to End Addiction's Helpline connects you with a helpline specialist like me for one-on-one -on -one support. You don't have to go through this alone. You can connect with us by sending a text message to 55753 or visiting our website drugfree.org to connect with a specialist today. So and this, this probably leads to, I mean, I know this is what your organization is dedicated to helping families through, because when you talk about that week, when you're madly, frantically on the phone, calling everybody and getting no's everywhere, <laughs> trying to find a bed, trying to find a place, trying to find if insurance covers it, um, it is incredibly stressful. And this is a family in enormous distress, under stress, trying to make an important decision. And so many times we pick a, a rehab and send our loved one or ourselves to it. And it turns out not to be appropriate. It turns out not to be even reputable. Right. Talk about how difficult it is today in this country, even with an epidemic that is killing so many people, the leading cause of death under the age of 50 is drug addiction. And I think, especially now with COVID, it's even harder we were just talking to someone who runs a reputable recovery place and they've had to cut their numbers back because at any given time their staff is down in numbers because they are also fighting covid um, it takes a while to get your you know your covid test and get it cleared before you can get into treatment so a lot of the places too financially have been hit hard because their numbers are down so between the places that aren't reputable and the body brokers that want to put you in those unreputable places and now with covid it's extremely hard to find and it's you know for someone who's in crisis it's nothing short of being in hell i mean to be honest so one of the things that we did early on, one of our initiatives was to try to create a web application that would take Mary's seven days of searching for a, uh, you know, one or two places to call mm -hmm. uh, and compress that down to a couple of hours, if not less than that. So, that, you know, you can filter out all the nonsense 
and you know the things that really aren't appropriate for you. And now here are the three places that I really ought to call who, who have a, a real decent shot of taking my son. So we, so we wrote a web application to do that. And it, it was a good application, but we wanted it to be better, which is why we were so happy to, to collaborate with Partnership to End Addiction to, to sort of do version two of that, mm -hmm. which is out there live right now and can be found on our website, which is safeproject.us. And it literally is almost like TurboTax where you're going in and it, it sort of interviews you about all, all of your particular characteristics. And it will yield, uh, based on a, a very sophisticated database from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, where you ought to look first. Uh, right. We don't get any profit out of it. We're not steering people in any particular direction. We just want to do the very best we can to prevent people from going through what Mary went through and frantically searching for a place for our son. Mary, you just mentioned body brokers. Explain what these people are. Um, I guess the best way to describe it would be you look online, you find it says uh, recovery or treatment help, mm -hmm. and you call this number and it's uh, recovery centers that are paying that person on the phone to direct you, you or your loved one to that facility whether it's the right place or not, whether it's reputable or not. Um, and they will do extreme things, to, uh, including coming and getting you, flying you across the country. Um, and then, you know, they will use your insurance. They will, you know, file claims that aren't legal or right or that, you know, for procedures that weren't done or medications or whatever. So um, it's, it's become a real money-making operation unfortunately it is people are making a lot of money while others are desperate for help and still not getting it I'm, yes. I'm curious why do you think it is in the military that i mean i grew up i'm an army brat um, my dad was in the army for 30 years i grew up on army bases um certainly when i was a kid um there wasn't any you know there wasn't counseling there wasn't a culture of therapy i think we've gotten better at that um but why do you think the military and armed forces are still lacking when it comes to understanding mental health and addiction, especially when we have well-documented decades of this scourge in the military ranks? Well, I think that the military itself for the uniform forces is actually getting better at this. Um, we recognize that mental health is an is a increasing problem for a variety of reasons, whether it's social media or what have you. Uh, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, are we're seeing higher incidences of mental health issues, and they're reacting to that. I think the challenge is, is with the family piece. And, and frankly, the, the military health care system is not well configured for family mental health issues, which is why, you know, we would tend to believe, and Mary is smarter on this than I am, that it really ought to be outsourced to, to professionals who understand family mental health. Mary, why aren't we better at that? I mean, if... if my gosh, when my dad went to Vietnam when I was six for a year, it was the most traumatic event of my life. These families are dramatically impacted. It's not just the men and women in uniform who are serving and sacrificing for our country. Their family members are. Yeah, exactly. Families do serve. And um, I think you have to, it's, it's not an easy answer. Um, you know, the military and the military healthcare system is, it's based on military readiness and making sure our troops are ready. Um, and it's not that families are an afterthought, but, you know, the first priority goes to our troops. And, you know, so it's, you and you've got people rotating in and out of those positions. Whereas somebody who's in the private sector, all they do is families. They aren't moving. They, that counselor, that psychiatrist, he's there. He understands this. Um, and so it's a little bit different priority shift. And in general, across the country right now, there is a huge shortage of providers, of therapists, of psychiatrists, psychologists. So, you know, it's not only the military and the VA that's suffering a shortage of people in this area, but it's our country writ large that has a real shortage in, in support. It's certainly been called a public health emergency now for years. And yet, Mary, um, you still see the stigma surrounding this disease, the shame surrounding this disease. There are families who don't reach out to somebody else for help because they're ashamed that their loved one or they are suffering. 
Yes. And um, that is probably the number one enemy. Um, we call it to, public enemy number one. Yes. Public enemy number one. And we've even started something called No Shame, uh, and that's fighting the stigma. We have a No Shame campaign, because as you mentioned, um, 20 million Americans over the age of 12 uh, suffer with some sort of substance use disorder. And um, we want to normalize this, make it part of the conversation. And so we have a no shame in my game, and there should be no shame in getting help for mental health or substance use. And we'd love it if people would come to the SAFE uh, Project website and take the No Shame in My Game pledge. And we'd love it, Elizabeth, if you'd be also <laughs> one of our, <laughs> you'd I'm pledge. Happy to. There's no stigma as well. This is one of the reasons, Elizabeth, why we did actually start SAFE Project. Um, you know, we could have crawled up into a little ball of anger, grief, and shame. Uh, but we decided that if, if people with our network, uh, with our, you know, the positions that we had, both mine in the military and Mary's as a, as a wonderful partner of mine in the military, if we would stand up and, and speak about this, mm -hmm. that maybe other people would realize that, you know, hey, hey, maybe there is something to the fact that this is a mental health issue, that it's a disease, not a moral failing. And we've had some success with that, I believe. We've had people come up to us and say, gosh, you know, my brother, my son, my daughter, uh, and uh, we've never said anything about it to anybody, but you know, you've, you've inspired us to, to be a little more open about this because that's the only way, you know, that's the, that's one of the linchpins to solving this crisis is and think back to the AIDS epidemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that was viewed as a moral failing and not a disease uh, for the longest time. And now it's, it's in the mainstream of our society that it's, it's understood and it, there are, there are drugs available to treat it. And it, you know, you see ads on TV for it. Well, we need to get this, uh, this disease uh, beyond where it is as far as stigma goes. And I think um, we're seeing probably the most progress with the younger generation. Um, and that's why we have such a strong emphasis. Our, our uh, nonprofit has such a strong emphasis on campuses mm -hmm. um, and not only helping people who are in recovery, making them stronger, um, but also normalizing the conversation on college campuses about this and, and speaking out and getting help and not being ashamed and, and also helping when you see somebody going down a path that is, could be fatal for them is, is actually, you know, it's better to step on their toes than to step on their grave. So, um, you know, really trying to normalize the whole substance use and mental health. This comes at a time during this pandemic when the CDC estimates that 80 million Americans are suffering mental health effects from this pandemic. Uh, many, many, many of them self-medicating. You know, we've got the numbers that show alcohol abuse and drug abuse. These numbers are rapidly escalating as we go through this time of enormous distress. Yeah, and uh, you know, when this pandemic is finally conquered, um, the epidemic of uh, substance, substance dependence is, is still going to be with us. Uh, and uh, it's in fact been made worse, as you point out, by the pandemic. So it, it's, you know, we don't want to get lost in the, in the chaff or whatever. Mm -hmm. We've got to continue our focus on this. And even after the, uh, the pandemic is, is sort of cleared out of, our, out of our system, we still have to focus night and day on, on resolving this epidemic. Mary, I was struck by something you said, which I think is really valuable for other parents who might be struggling with children who are in the cycle of substance abuse. You said, don't let hope be a strategy. Yeah, I mean, it's only normal for a parent to hope that this is going to go away, to hope that, um, you know, this was a one-time event, to hope that, you know, once we get past this hurdle or once we get past this exam or once he gets, they get accepted into college or whatever it is, um, that everything will go back to normal. And because this is a disease of the brain, um, it, it takes more than what we, what we moms and dads and families can do. It really, and I think that's probably one of the hardest things as well. Again, you know, as a parent, you want to protect, you want to heal, you, you know, you want to make everything right in their world. 
And this is something that we can't, we don't know enough yet about the brain. Um, and it really takes, it takes a village to really get somebody through that. And then it takes the support afterwards, which is where that's where we lost our son was, you know, after treatment, the support that he needed and we didn't realize. And you know, Elizabeth, um, you know, this sounds uh, tough to say, but um, chances are, if you think it's bad, it's probably worse uh, yeah. than you think. Wow. And, and we went through times when we had Jonathan in counseling, when we would look at each other and say, you know, we really just need to get him away from this environment and into something completely separate. And uh, we should have done it sooner than we did. Uh, I don't know if it would have made a difference in the long run, but uh, I think seizing control of this problem and Facing reality, and again, as Mary said, not letting hope be a strategy is just terribly critical for parents. And it's a very hard thing to do because you believe in your kids. You think they're going to be great, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, they're always, sometimes they're struggling more than you think. And I think probably also the hardest thing is, uh, is that they're, on their end, they're ashamed. Right. Um, I know our, I know that our son was, and I know this is not where he wanted to be. And as I tell people, no one ever grows up saying, I want to be dead at age 19. Nobody, nobody grows up and says, I want to be homeless. Nobody grows up and says, you know, I want, I want to be an addict um, or have a substance use disorder. Um, nobody in their right mind does that. Um, so we need to start thinking of it. This, there's something that has happened that's out of their control. Um, and we need to find ways to support them. We need to have more research and uh, and I'll, I'll give a little. I'll give a little shout out to John um, for your audience. Um, you know, mm -hmm. when John was going through, uh, getting ready to go to college, uh, mm -hmm. the school he was going to had the requirement for an essay uh, for every incoming freshman. And the question they asked that year in 2017 was, "Who has had the most influence on your life?" And of course, Mary and I would think, "Well, of course, it was his parents." Uh, but in fact, he wrote this powerful, well-written essay that refers back to, to uh, a, a time when he was on an ambulance ride during his EMT qualification, and he found himself in a bathroom uh, in a McDonald's in New Haven, Connecticut, giving CPR to a man undergoing a heroin overdose. And he writes about how he felt for this guy and, and what would his family feel like if he didn't make it through the night. And uh, he closes this amazing essay with, uh, you know, and, and this man has, has uh, inspired me to dedicate my life to helping those who cannot help themselves. And of course, it wasn't two weeks later that we lost John, but that those words in, in his essay really resonate in our minds. And that's really why we started Safe Project, because we wanted to continue what he saw as his mission. Uh, and uh, you know, he may have lost the battle, but he's gonna help us win the war. That makes you wonder what he could have done, you know, yeah. with his life, had he been able to. Yeah, he was a remarkable, young man who unfortunately was suffering. Mary, that's obviously hard for you. Yeah. It is. Very. <laughs> Sorry. But we get up every morning and we have a wonderful staff uh, working at Safe Project and uh, we're very proud of them for what they do every day. They, they are inspired by Jonathan. They're, they, uh, they know what their mission is and we've got a lot of great, great programs going on. So we, you know, it, it, candidly, if this weren't such a personal family tragedy, it would almost be fun because it's such a complex problem and complex problems are fun to solve. But uh, this is deadly serious. This is deadly serious. And nobody knows that more you know, tragically, I think, than, you know, obviously families like yours. Um, I'm curious, both of you have been incredibly generous um, about sharing what this has been like for you. What has this all been like for John's big brother? I can't, we've never actually talked about that. You know, John's brother, uh, who, by the way, a, as we literally speak right now, is on his way home from Baghdad, Iraq, where he was deployed. Wow. And he gets back in a day or so. It's a long trip. Um, you know, he uh, freely admits that while, you know, John was in his, in his later years, uh, he was stigmatized by Jonathan you know, he said, hey, he's just a drug addict. You know, he's, he's not living up to our family values. He's doing the wrong things and that sort of stuff. And it was only after we lost John that LJ um, really sort of dug into this 
and, and realized that Jonathan was actually doing something much more difficult than LJ at the Naval Academy was, uh, you know, overcoming this terrible disease and fighting, fighting every day uh, to, to win it. Um, and LJ felt strongly enough that he wrote an, uh, an op-ed in USA Today about stigma. And it was a wonderful piece of work about how he had been stigmatized by uh, what his little brother was going through and how much he really appreciates now uh, what he was fighting for. And, um, and on that note, I think uh, LJ just personally now and as serving his country in uniform um, has given him new insight. Uh, and I know there have been a couple of occasions where he has probably actually <clears throat> saved a life of a fellow buddy in uniform. Um, who was so, struggling. Yeah. Who, yeah, who was struggling. Because so. he recognized the signs having watched his brother. Yeah. And he recognized the signs. And after his article in USA Today came out, he actually had other members of the military, even at the Naval Academy, come up to him and say, hey, I've been struggling. I'm in recovery. Um, but I never, thank you to your family. I never would have talked about this to anybody here before. So, um, you know, he's, mm -hmm. and he knows now to you guys that work for him, uh, to, how to talk them through things, how, if they have things going on in their families, what to look for after they return from a deployment, um, some warning signals. So, um, very proud of him. Yeah. And they were best buddies growing up. So he misses his, his little buddy. Yeah. Um, Johnny boy, he called him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and, uh, but, uh, we've all learned from it and LJ, uh, definitely so. It's amazing that when people like you and your entire family now speak out like this, it really does puncture, at least momentarily, that shame and stigma. And people do come. They flock often to you when you speak out and share your story. They are almost, they're so hungry, sometimes even desperate to be able to tell somebody I'm struggling or my mom or my sister or my brother or my dad my son, they're struggling. Yeah, normally, uh, you know, it's, it's almost, you can almost time it. Uh, for me, Sunday mornings, for some reason, I get, uh, you know, a friend of a friend will hand out my information and I'll get a call or an email of a family that's in crisis. Um, and, it, and for some reason, it's not, you know, I don't know why Sunday mornings, but maybe it's, you know, they're just thinking at home, knowing they can't go through another week the way that they're going, um, that people will reach out. And, you know, that's our motto. We want to save a life every day. Um, and so we're here to support anyone and everyone. You know, and the interesting thing, Elizabeth, with the kind of work that our nonprofit does, you know, the input metrics are all over the place. You know, how many kids have we talked to? How many doTERRA bags have we handed out for, for um you know, destroying opioids and that kind of thing. The output metric of how, how many lives have you saved is something you just, it's really hard to measure, right? You, you don't know necessarily that you saved a life, except for those rare moments when you get an email from somebody. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget early on in this journey, we, we got an email from a, a gentleman who said, you know, I'm sitting here in the emergency room with my 14 year old son who is addicted to opioids. And we have decided we're going to take control of this and we're going to get him into treatment. And the reason we're here is because we read your stuff. Mm. And you just, that just kind of makes you go for another day. <laughs> and there are a few other examples of that that we've run into along the way that, that make us at least believe uh, in our hearts that we're making a difference out there uh, in a lot of different ways with all the different things that we do. Uh, but, it would, you know, it's, the metrics are hard. I have no doubt you are both making an incredible difference, both of you and LJ. Admiral Winnefeld, Mary, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you for your service to our country. And thank you for all the work you do helping families who are struggling in really, really difficult times. Well, you're very welcome, Elizabeth, and thank you yeah. for uh, bringing uh, more light to bear on this very, very uh, big challenge that our country faces. We appreciate it. It is. It's a crisis. It's a public health emergency. It is a crisis. It is an epidemic, as you have said. Again, they have co-founded the SAFE Project. It's a nonprofit committed to overcoming the epidemic of addiction in the United States. You can find more information about the organization online.
Thank you so much for listening to my talk with Admiral Winnefeld and his wife, Mary. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And if you want to learn more about Safe Project, visit safeproject.us. As a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who's struggling with substance use, text 55753 or visit us at drugfree.org. Talk to you soon.